We've been working very closely, all agencies, to move toward a safe supply, which is essentially a pharma pharmaceutical substitute for illicit drugs. Tonight, how Vancouver is managing the spread of COVID-19 on the downtown east side. I suppose uh, how much uh, game or hunting can be done, that really varies on what animal species they're going after. And northern communities get funding to have hunters go out on the land. Good evening. Welcome to your Tuesday edition of APTN National News. I'm Brittany Hobson. We been, begin tonight in Alberta, where an Indigenous man has died as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. 34-year-old Sean Auger passed away Monday morning in hospital. It is believed he is the first Indigenous person to die due to the virus. APTN's Tamara Pimentel brings us more on this. Sean OJ is remembered as a loving husband who gave back to his community and is known for his sense of humor. The 34-year-old from High Prairie in northern Alberta was diagnosed with the COVID-19 virus March 13. The father of three was a youth care worker. He had asthma and was particularly susceptible to the virus. Family and friends took to social media to announce his passing. A Facebook post by Big Lakes County states we are a close-knit community and this news will be hard for everyone. A representative of the Native Hockey Alberta Council, members of the community honoured Auger by placing hockey sticks outside of their front doors. Auger is the youngest person in Alberta to die of COVID-19. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Two Métis men were found shot to death in eastern Alberta over the weekend. The RCMP are asking for the public's help to identify two trucks seen near the scene. APTN's Chris Stewart has the story. 39-year-old Jacob Samson and his uncle, Morris Cardinal, 57, were out hunting on the night of Friday, March 27th. They never returned home. Their bodies were discovered outside their truck by a passerby on Range Road 84 near the small town of Glendon around 4 a.m. Saturday morning. We have two males who were located on a road with uh, what appears to be obvious gunshot wounds. So the Major Crimes Unit is investigating. RCMP received tips from the public and are looking for two trucks, one of which is a black 2014 Dodge Ram 1500. They are asking the public to call if they have seen the trucks or know about this crime. We have received calls from people in the public. We thank the public for that. People have reported having seen two trucks that were seen driving on Range Road 84 between 8 and 10. Now we're trying to speak to the drivers and occupants of those two trucks. The RCMP say more answers will be coming after autopsies are completed. Currently, Sansom's and Cardinal's deaths are labeled as suspicious. Jacob Sanson's mother, Ruby Smith, wrote to APTN she wants to see justice for her son and brother. There is a Facebook tribute to both Jacob and Morris. A GoFundMe has been set up to help Jacob's family and funeral expenses. Morris is survived by his daughter. Jacob is survived by his wife and three children. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. To Prince Albert now, where police in the city are investigating a triple homicide. Police say three people were found dead in a home, including a seven-year-old boy. CTV's Lisa Rizm has more. This was the scene early Sunday afternoon as police and paramedics arrived at this house on MacArthur Drive. It probably is the coronavirus. <laughs> Neighbors say they first thought it was coronavirus, but quickly learned otherwise. The three people had been murdered in that house there. And so we were pretty shocked to hear that because it's not at all what we expected to happen, especially so close to your home or in your neighborhood. Prince Albert police say three people were found dead inside the home. A seven-year-old boy seen here with his dad and sister was killed, along with a man and a woman who were both 56 years old. McLaughlin says the couple was quiet and friendly. So we did, in fact, know them. Um, my mother knew them pretty well. 
And so it, it's honestly just kind of a shock and a surprise that something like that would happen to people that you know. The boy's five-year-old sister was airlifted to hospital in Edmonton in critical condition. A GoFundMe page set up for the children's family states the girl's condition is now stable after three surgeries. Police say the suspect knew the victims. It's a tragedy um, like uh, that's unimaginable for for uh, the, the community, our staff, and, and definitely uh, the family of, of the, the uh, loved ones here who are now deceased. Police have not told us how the people died, nor have they said what kind of injuries the five-year-old girl was taken to hospital with. But they do say there is no threat to the public and that the killings were not random. Lisa Rizm, CTV News, Prince Albert. We have more details now on that triple homicide in Prince Albert. Family friends have identified two of the victims as Sandra Henry Carrier and Dennis Carrier. Both were 56 years old. The five-year-old girl who was injured remains in hospital in stable condition. Police have not said whether charges have been laid. Prominent lawyer Don Warm is our guest on an all-new episode of Face to Face tonight, right after the national news. Warm played major roles in the in inquiries into the deaths of Neil Stonechild and Dudley George. He often finds himself representing Indigenous peoples who are at odds with police services and institutions. And the issue between uh, law enforcement and Indigenous people has been one that is prevalent since uh, the, the government brought in uh, brought in the Northwest Mounted Police uh, in order to uh, to enforce what were really unjust laws at the time, including, for example, the past system, which has no basis in law, in fact, but it was simply a policy that someone had dreamed up in order to further repress uh, Indigenous people, and in particular Indians in this country. Time for a quick break. Coming up, a look at how Vancouver's downtown east side is handling COVID-19. Here's Wednesday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Three degrees in St. John's, six in Halifax, minus two in Nain, three above in Happy Valley Goose Bay, two degrees in Quebec City, a mix of sun and cloud, and six in Montreal, ten above in Toronto and London, five in North Bay, six in Timmins, cloudy and nine in Wawa, in northern Manitoba, minus one in Thompson, five degrees in Norway House, seven above in Gimli, four in Brandon. In Frontline workers on Vancouver's downtown east side are sounding the alarm. They're worried there's a potential catastrophe brewing for people with addictions and the ongoing spread of the COVID-19 virus. Tina House has more. This was the scene recently on Welfare Wednesday. People trying to cash their checks. Some are social distancing. Others are not. The downtown east side is a neighborhood struggling with an opioid epidemic that's claimed the lives of thousands of people. And now it's facing a new fight. Those on the front lines say if COVID-19 gets down here, it will spread quickly. And because of people's already weakened immune systems, it could also be deadly. Who knows what could happen? It could be the perfect storm, right? And down here on the streets, things are noticeably changing. Normally, the Vancouver police walk the beat and make their presence known. But now, instead, they drive close to the sidewalks with their windows rolled up, talking on a loudspeaker, like in this cell phone video. It's for your safety and your loved one's safety. Please spread it out. And despite being told from police to stay six feet apart, not many are heeding that advice. Wagila Hunt works on the front lines in harm reduction. She says that part of her job is saving someone from overdosing. But since COVID-19, giving those rescue breaths through a rubber mask is now putting her own life at risk. Those masks aren't properly uh, filtered, um, so when we're breathing into them, um, we're um, exposed to COVID if the person is, is infected. Um, and then when we're breathing into them, it's also releasing um, it into the air, which is what we're told by paramedics. 
Everybody on the bus should have to wear them. COVID-19 has changed the lives of everyone around the globe. And for people with addictions, their lives have also changed. Trey Helton works with the Overdose Prevention Society. He says that since Canada has closed its border, that's also affected the illegal drug supply. Locals are saying that the supply is running out and the costs of drugs are slowly rising. And Trey is concerned what will happen if that illegal drug supply runs out. A lot of people like have dangerous hustles. Um, you know, the, the, some of those hustles are stealing bicycles, boosting from stores. Um, with the stores closed, that's you got to do something else. A lot of people are talking about, yeah, for sure, robberies, different different sorts of things like that. Yeah. Vancouver's drug addicted and homeless are now faced with being more vulnerable to COVID-19, and with the drug shortage, they're getting desperate. Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart is now looking at ways of getting people legal and safe drugs. We've been working very closely, all agencies, to move toward a safe supply, which is essentially a pharma pharmaceutical substitute for illicit drugs. Uh, the, the federal government has uh, taken all measures required for this to be operational in the province, and now we're uh, just waiting for the provincial guidelines. Wagila Hunt is worried. She says self-isolation down here is next to impossible, and the support system for Vancouver's most vulnerable is getting worse by the day. They're basically just like shutting down services, and people are having nowhere to go. You know, washrooms are being shut down. Um, you know, food lines are being shut down, um, and these people are all people you know that live in these. SROs around or buildings, most of them don't have food security, they have nowhere to go, so, you know, nobody's going to stay inside when there's nothing for them inside. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. A retired Northern Health official has sent an open letter to the government of British Columbia asking for transparency on COVID-19 confirmation results. It's information he says will help communities prepare against the pandemic. Northern Health Region covers two-thirds of the province. At the moment, COVID updates are coming from BC health officials in the south. Northern BC has 14 confirmed cases, but no specific locations. Retired Northern Health Chief Medical Officer Dr. David Bowring believes that if people knew where cases have been confirmed, there would be less speculation and rumors, which he says have been on the rise in communities. I think it would help people immensely to know that in terms of they might even they might become you know, more vigilant, they might change what they're doing. And without that information, they're doing their best and they're doing amazingly well. I can, I can see it everywhere I go, but it's just that we need, I think we need to have that. And I don't think we should be sort of hoarding this information centrally anymore. I think this is too serious and it, and it involves everybody. Pima Chikamak Cree Nation and Norway House Cree Nation are calling on the Minister of National Defence to set up a military hospital within their territory. The chiefs of the two Cree nations in northern Manitoba are awaiting a response from Minister Harjit Sajan. In a letter sent to the federal government, the leaders say, under normal circumstances, the 15,000 plus members between the two communities are hard pressed to receive adequate health care services. Both communities have declared states of emergencies and are on lockdown. The chiefs believe the military Medical infrastructure can address gaps on health services such as testing, quarantining, housing and medevacking First Nation people who are affected by COVID-19. The leaders feel it is not a matter of if, but when the virus will hit communities. Still in Manitoba, the Chief Public Health Officer has announced seven new cases of COVID-19 in the province, bringing the total diagnosed to 103. Total deaths remain at one. Dr. Brent Rusin has also confirmed a medical worker has been infected. A staff member at Selkirk Regional Health Centre has tested positive for COVID-19. This individual worked in the health centre's emergency department and medicine ward from March 19th to March 23rd. Public Health, Occupational Health and Infection Prevention and Control uh, staff are working together to investigate this case. and. This announcement follows growing concerns that frontline healthcare providers do not have the adequate equipment to protect themselves from the virus. As the global health crisis continues, some Northern First Nations are closing their communities off for safety reasons. 
Among them is Anna Kamikshik and Shawabek in the Sudbury area. CTV's Ian Campbell reports. Here on the outskirts of Atikmikshing, Anishinaabek, only residents getting in and out right now. The border is closed. So now is not the time uh, to be visiting. It's the time, and everybody, all the medical professionals are telling us, it's the time to stay home. And so uh, we're really discouraging people. We're stopping people. Don't come here. We're not selling tobacco. The stores are closed. Riche says it was a difficult decision to make and that this is about protecting everyone and keeping them safe. We are an at-risk population, and we know that from from our own experiences and studies that confirm that. So we need to protect our people um, as much as possible. It's a similar story in Wanapate, north of Sudbury. It's now closed to all outside traffic. Chief Larry Rock says the community of 100 has an older population. He's hoping this will encourage physical isolation. People just have to adhere to it, and then this virus will be done with it. But it's so hard, and it's a tough choice that we have to make to because we love having people come out here. It's a little more difficult for Nipissing First Nation to close. It has the Trans-Canada going right through it. Chief Scott McLeod tells CTV they're looking at all feasible options and adds the help so far from the provincial and federal governments is a good start. Uh, in Nipissing, we're down to 30, you know, 30 uh, language speakers, all of which are of uh, senior years. And uh, it, it becomes a very critical uh, situation on top of an already critical situation when, when dealing with that. Uh, so... Um, we've, got a lot we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. Some we spoke with say they're lucky to be near a larger center that has medical supports in place. There are some indigenous communities in Canada that can't say that. Assembly of First Nations Chief Perry Bellegarde has declared a state of emergency. He wants prevention efforts and preparation for critical care to be stepped up now. Ian Campbell, CTV News, Sudbury. Federal and territorial governments are offering incentives to get more people on the land during the pandemic. More on that after the break. Here's the rest of Wednesday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta. Minus 14 in Fort McMurray, minus 11 in Grand Prairie. Sun in minus 9 in Edmonton, minus 10 in Calgary. On the west coast, 5 above in Penticton, 2 in Kamloops. Zero in Smithers, Sun, and six above in Prince Rupert. In the Yukon, minus five in Whitehorse, Beaver Creek, and Dawson. Over to the NWT, minus nine in Trout Lake. Sun and minus 13 in Yellowknife. Minus 12 in Colville Lake. Minus 15 in Saks Harbor. In Nunavut, a chilly minus 25 in Repulse Bay. Minus eight in Arviat. Minus 18 in Clyde River. Minus 22 and sun in Arctic Bay. Welcome back. Communities in the Northwest Territories are getting $2.6 million in federal funding to go on the land. The money was announced this week as a way to increase physical distancing during the pandemic. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs has more on this welcome strategy. The population density in the Northwest Territories is less than 1% per square kilometre. But in isolated communities with overcrowded homes, conventional physical distancing, like staying home, may not be possible. So community members across Day are going on the land during the COVID-19 pandemic. Jessica Deliri in Detta is one of them. Being from YKDFN, I mean, there was a really big pandemic um, back in the day, like way, way, way a long time ago, like way back in the day. Um, and the elders are saying, you know, just live off the land, go out in the bush, you know, separate yourself as much as possible, try not to, to associate with too many people. Even with the joys of being on the land, Deliri says there's concern for elders who are staying back. With my grandma, she lives in the community and we're trying to limit, you know, her visitors as much as possible. Um, she is, she is older. Um, so, you know, I just, we just want to, we as a family just want to make sure that she's taken care of and, you know, that nobody is, is, um, is coming and going and trying to limit that social interaction that she has. But I think as small communities, it's just, it's really hard. 
On March 30th, the Territorial Government and Indigenous Services Canada announced $2.6 million to pay for on-the-land initiatives. Chief Norman Yakalaya says this type of prevention is what will protect the communities. We want to set the path in regards to how we keep our people uh, safe and at the same time relearn new skills, new discipline, and uh, that is to support all our communities for people who want to go on the land. The money will flow through community governments, with some regional governments already offering money for gas and groceries. With over 1,000 tests taken so far, the NWT has one positive case. And with spring hunts traditionally taking place this time of year anyways, parents like Deliri are looking forward to sharing quality time with family. With schools being out, I think it's a really cool time that I can take to teach my kids um, bush, bush skills. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Deda. One of the first responses from the government of Nunavut when faced with the COVID-19 pandemic was to provide money to local hunters and trappers organizations in the territory. Each community received $25,000 to pay hunters and buy their supplies. Nunavut Tungavik, Nunavut's Territorial Inuit Association, kicked in another $10,000 per community. The idea is to increase local food supply in case COVID-19 causes disruptions in the supply chain. To the best of my uh, knowledge, all the contribution agreements have been signed and I think most of the money is in the hands of the HTO now. As opposed to uh, how much uh, game or hunting can be done, that really varies on what animal species they're going after. Whether In Manitoba, one community is taking creative steps to address food security during the pandemic while also getting people out on the land. Shimadawa First Nation hired a handful of members to hunt, prepare and clean meat for the community. The hunters were hired last week and have already harvested some caribou. The food is being distributed to vulnerable people, including elders, people with weak immune systems, and children. The remote First Nation is located 740 kilometers from Winnipeg and is only accessible by air or winter road. They recently closed their borders for no all non-essential travel. We're doing it on a larger scale this, this time around rather than, uh, you know, for community gatherings and feasts. This is... Uh, a larger scale to, to prep for worst case scenario. So it is very different than previous years in terms of harvesting. Shimano has always had a strong connection with, with our land and our territory. And I think the COVID-19 situation kind of uh, solidifying that and people, I, I wouldn't say it's more, but I think, I think we value it a lot more than just uh, than, than before. And that's your APTN National News for this Tuesday. Stay up to date with the very latest on COVID-19 by visiting our special page, aptnnews.ca slash COVID-19, and by downloading the APTN News app. Stick around, Face to Face is next. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a good evening.